Okay, listen up. I got like 20 emails about this video. I don't know why. I don't know if it was like a botnet or something. Th this happens every once in a while where a video will come out and I'll get like tw 20 emails that are like, hey, listen, I, I don't know if you're busy, but like, I think it would be very important for you to go there. It's like a, it's like a business prompt or something. And it only happens to some videos. And it's usually videos in the scientific community. And they're not bots, I don't think, uh, because all the emails are different. And there's only like 20 and not like 2000. It's very strange to me. Apparently, people are really upset about this. Sabine Hassenfelder is apparently a science education channel that I've never seen. So I'm coming in this with, with no awareness. Dopamine addiction is a myth. Here's what the science says. I gotta say, I'm a little bit curious as to why she's dressing like a Jedi in this. I think faster than light travel is possible, here's why. Okay, immediately I'm feeling a little bit skeptical. Uh, I don't know what the contents of these videos are, but I'm a little skeptical. But I'm also not a science person, so I don't know. Um, but apparently people are upset about this video. Is being trans a social fad among teenagers? Okay. Let's address this from the beginning. I think that all elements of your identity are, to an extent, a social fad. For example, compulsive heterosexuality, or comphet, the idea that heterosexuality is presented as a kind of default modal norm for humans, it, it compels people to act and live as heterosexuals as, uh, as a fad. Um, now, usually when we say fad, we're, we're using this in kind of like a derisive way, like, oh, it's just a fad. But if by fad, what we mean is, are there social influences? Then the answer is yes and everywhere. The question is, are these influences harmful? So here's like a comparison, okay? Compulsive heterosexuality would lead people to beat and murder gay people for living their lives. That seems bad. Whereas the current popularity of being trans when you're younger doesn't seem to lead to straight or cisgender people getting beaten to death on the streets. We have not seen a, you know, uh, this giant wave of hundreds and hundreds of anti-cisgender laws. So I don't think whatever trend is happening right now, whatever shift in popularity, I don't think that it's harmful in the way that the previous trends have been. So there you go. That's, that's the opening. You like that? Like that nuance? Nothing less for uh, critiquing, maybe not even critiquing, I haven't seen the video yet, uh, a science YouTube channel. Okay, what's up? Gender teens transition. This rather person... Should transgender teens transition? This rather personal question occupies a prominent place in the American culture war. On the one side, you have people claiming that it's a socially contagious fat among the brainwashed woke who want to mutilate your innocent children, on the other side, there are those saying that it's saving the lives of minorities who've been forced to stay in the closet for too long. And then there are normal people like you and I. She's German. Who think both sides are crazy. And could someone please summarize the facts? In Sabine Hassenfelder? Simple words, which is what I'm here for. So what's going on? Is it true that the number of teenagers who identify as transgender is rising rapidly? What's gender affirming care? Does it work? And why are some countries like Sweden, Finland and the UK rolling back gender affirming treatments for children? That's what we'll talk about today. Without the, the vast majority of humans are born with an unambiguous biological sex that's either male or female. While there are some intersex conditions, they're rare. For the most part, biological sex in humans is fairly simple. People with XX chromosomes are biologically female, have ovaries and grow breasts. People with XY chromosomes are biologically male, have testicles and leave the toilet seat up. I don't know if I'd say it's simple, but yes, generally people fall into those categories. Uh, it's uh, called a bimodal range. Oh, nice. There are actual non-automatically generated subtitles. It's more difficult for some fish who can change their sex, but there are few fish among my subscribers. So with apologies to all fish who may be watching, I'll leave this complication aside. Gender identity. I don't leave the toilet seat up because I have seen multiple times Pigeon and Artemy try to jump onto the toilet seat without looking to see if it was up or down first and I do not want them to leap directly into the toilet. 
identity is as difficult as sex is simple. Gender refers to our internal sense of being female, male, or something else. As everything internal, it's subjective and hard to properly define. I re I, I've never liked... So th this isn't me blaming her, because this is like a really common way of framing it. I really do not like... Um, thinking of gender as something internal, because I think I think it's the opposite, right? Like, my biological sex is confined literally to my body. It is as constrained and internal as anything can be. It's literally just me. Whereas when I say, like, well, what does it mean to be a man? That's like this huge cultural social thing. Um, so I, I think there's an internal component, of course, but, you know, obviously I think it's, um, we are we are very much riding the waves of, of social... Um, you know, of, of social acknowledgement with that. Gender identity comes about by a mix of genes, acquired biological traits, environmental and social factors, and cultural expectations. When someone's perceived gender doesn't align with their biological sex, we've come to call them transgender. The other case, when sex aligns with gender, is often called cisgender. Transgender people may feel like they're trapped in the wrong body. Not all, but some of them are distressed by this experience and develop what's called gender dysphoria, a recognized psychological condition which might severely limit their quality of life this is complicated but i'm trying not to be a pedant um we talk about this so so much that i'll have like a million thoughts in every level of the video so i'm going to try to move to you know eventually she's going to start making prescriptive statements and that's what i'm interested in talking about some transgender people prefer not to draw a distinction between sex and gender and instead distinguish between their experienced gender and the assigned gender or the gender assigned at birth. For the rest of this video, we'll do the same. Ooh, I don't like that at all. Um, acknowledging a distinction between gender and sex is really important to me because otherwise we're just kind of doing the reverse version of when conservatives say they mean the same thing. Like your gender is your genitals, but now it's like, actually your genitals or your gender and um well if that's what she's going with okay we'll work with it we'll work with it it's one of the reasons why i'm an advocate for the use of the term transsexual and transgender where transgender people are simply people who aren't cisgender and transsexual people are people who engage in some kind of sexual reassignment um i think that for most people who are transgender they would probably consider themselves both but there are a lot of especially non-binary people who are transgender objectively by the definition of the term that don't have any like issues with their biological sex or anything like that so they would be transgender but not transsexual and then like there are plenty of binary transgender people who are both transgender and transsexual it sounds old-fashioned and old-timey um but it's 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 a legitimately useful distinction because to say transgender in all cases with no distinction, is kind of to imply that gender and sex are the same thing. Would you say then that HRT femboys are transsexual but not transgender? Yes. Yes, I would. And I know people like that. Mm-hmm. Being transgender is neither new nor necessarily detrimental to mental health. It's just a not very common variation of normal human development. Personally, I find it highly questionable there is such a thing as normal human development to begin with. Have you ever seen a normal human? I haven't. More seriously, records of transgender people date back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Several cultures, for example in India and Thailand, have communities of a third neutral gender. Unfortunately, transgender people have historically been stigmatized in many societies, have been ridiculed, been targets of violence, and been forced to... They look really good. This is a nice shirt. I like these colors. ...fit into the binary masculine-feminine pattern. In many places, this is still happening, and in some countries, such as Indonesia and Nigeria, being transgender is still illegal. The combination of social and physical challenges makes the lives of transgender people, especially young ones, difficult. A 2017 survey of 125,000 American high school students found that transgender students were much more likely to report having suffered sexual violence while on a date, a problem that affects more than one in five, and about one in three reported having attempted suicide. That's more than three times higher than the suicide risk among cis women. This is why, starting in the 1970s, the medical profession took steps to prevent psychological distress of transgender people, the Dutch leading the way. This isn't a history channel, so I won't go through all the twists and turns. Let me just tell you how gender dysphoria is defined today. 
Psychiatrists classify mental disorders using the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM for short. Its latest edition is the DSM-5TR, that's the 2022 update. It specifies gender dysphoria in children as a marked incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and assigned gender of at least six months duration that is accompanied by a strong desire to be of the other gender or an insistence that one is of the other gender or some alternative gender different from one's assigned gender. It must be associated with significant stress and at least five other symptoms, such as a strong preference for toys or clothes stereotypically used by the other gender or a strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy. That's the di- So, mm, okay, that's a very messy sentence. Well, it's medical writing, it's always like that. Um, okay, this, this, this stuff gets, um, this gets really complicated. How do I, um, hmm. Okay. I've talked about this before and people get really mad at me, but basically I think that there are, um, I think that there are three kinds of dysphoria that all get lumped together. All right. The kind that everyone imagines and the kind that gets talked about most, I think, is this like innate, ingrained, biological, reflexive discomfort with the sexual attributes of your body. Like having a dick and like being disgustedly uncomfortable with it. And like you, you're so like solidly intent that your body should be of the other sex, uh, that it like it, it the, the negative thoughts surrounding it are, are like distressing and negative to your life. I think there's a kind of dysphoria that people have where if you could imagine a transgender woman who might not necessarily mind having like, say, broader shoulders, being a bit taller and having a dick, but there's such a strong social association between being a woman and not having those things that they get upset by the uh, incongruence or distinction, um, like uh, in and of itself, but they wouldn't say if they were just like, um, like trapped on a desert island. That that's like the standard, right? It's art, when you're trapped in a desert island, how much carries over? And then for the first category, I'd say like all of it, like all of the dysphoria would carry over. And for the second category, I'd say that that none of it would. Um, and then the third, like sort of broad category that I would fit here is just a, um, how do I put this? You, you know how 5,000 years from now, when we live in the cyberpunk future, we'll be able to enter a pod that'll like change our bodies on a whim or whatever. I think most people, if they could do so freely, would change something about their body or identity. And the more freeing society is, the more likely people are to go for radical changes. If it's easy to do so, not expensive, not damaging, whatever else. I think that to an extent, a lot of young people today are just, I don't want to sound dismissive. I think a lot of like Gen Z people who identify as non-binary just kind of like, I don't know, draw furry art and wish they were like a big werewolf or something. It's not a specific dysphoria associated with sexual incongruity so much as it is a broader and greater willingness to imagine yourself outside the confines of what human biology, uh, I guess, quote unquote, had in store for you. So it's not like, ah, oh, I was I was destined to be born a female. And it's not like, ah, oh, well, I was okay with my body, but the social implications are what's upsetting me. It's more like, wow, I just really just, just don't care that much about what I'm meant to be, and I'm okay with being other things. Does that make sense? Those are so I think those when when I've talked to trans people, those are the three like descriptions of how they feel that I hear. More or less in those categories. It's vague, obviously. Um, if you, if you, if you're picking up what I'm putting down. So those are my thoughts. And I'm sorry, I've paused this for far too long. Diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Now let's talk about this self-identification as transgender. The share of people who identify as transgender in the developed world is typically around half a percent. For example, in the 2021 UK government census, about 0.5% of people older than 16 answered no to the question of whether their gender is the same as their sex registered at birth. The US Census Bureau did a similar survey in 2021 and saw 0.6% identifying as transgender. A 2021 census in Canada Canada, among people aged 15 and older, saw 0.19% identify as transgender and 0.15% as non-binary.
Curiously, though, the fraction is considerably higher among teenagers than among adults. For example, last year, a survey from the Williams Institute at UCLA found that in the age group 13 to 17, the percentage of Americans who identify as transgender is about 1.4%, oh, no. more than twice as high as that among adults. And while the percentage of adults that identify as transgender has remained roughly stable, that among teenagers has almost doubled from 2016 to 2021. It's a steep increase. In the United States, the number of gender clinics which treat children has grown from basically none to more than 100 in 15 years. Just like the wrinkles in my face, a good reminder that correlation is not causation. According to data collected by the American health tech company Komodo Health for Reuters, the number of insured children aged 6 to 17 diagnosed with gender dysphoria in the US has increased from 15,000 in 2017 to 42,000 in 2021, so roughly a factor 2 to 3. About 6,000 of them are either on puberty blockers are undergoing hormone therapy man it's so few people in 2021 minors with a gender dysphoria diagnosis initiating puberty blocker treatment just over 1,000 in the entire united states of america with with 350 million people that's like like <laughs> it's uh so marginal Western civilization has fallen. One expects the two numbers to be somewhat higher because they didn't count cases that were not covered by insurance, but it's probably not a huge difference. To put these numbers into context, there are about 25 million children in the US in that age group, which means we're talking about roughly three in the 10,000 children who are taking medication for gender dysphoria. So we may be looking at a steep increase, but the total numbers are small. Still, it's puzzling and not an exclusively American phenomenon either. The same has been observed in the UK. I don't know if I would say it's puzzling. It seems pretty straightforward. We see this exact same trend every time there's any, like, like we saw the same thing with gay people. Everyone's seen the left hand in this graph where it went up like sharply and then, and then tapered off, you know? If you, if you have like incredibly um, arbitrary, strict social restrictions against a group of people that get kind of like lifted or alleviated like you're going to see stuff like this happen um you know a lot of boomers are like oh back in my day like we didn't have all these kids with autism yes you did you just didn't diagnose them with autism you just didn't you didn't know they were still there Okay, where the number of referrals to the British Gender Identity Development Service has increased by more than a factor of 20 from 2011 to 2020. It's also been seen in Sweden and in Canada and pretty much everywhere where they've collected numbers. Curiously enough, the big bulk of the increase comes from children assigned female at birth, wishing to transition to male. This is weird because in earlier generations, the ratio was the other way around or approximately equal. The same thing has been observed in the Netherlands, in Spain, in the UK, Canada, Sweden, and is also the case in the USA. Most of the increase in gender dysphoria reports comes from girls. Pretty much no one questions this. What's more controversial is the- I don't like that phrasing. Pretty much no one questions this. This video is generally trying to be pretty objective, I feel, but this is a very, like, narratively loaded thing to say that doesn't add any information other than, like, a vague hint of conspiracism. There are potential explanations that you could go into, but why? the question whether the typical age of girls to report gender dysphoria is also changing, and if so, why? In 2018, the American physician Lisa Littman argued in a paper based on survey results among parents that the girls being referred to gender clinics in recent years are different from those of earlier generations. They show an onset of gender dysphoria during adolescence, but without prior symptoms, a combination that was previously basically unheard of. Littman dubbed it rapid onset of gender dysphoria and suggests that it's a case of social contagion. Right. So, as we've said before, this study methodology was surveying parents of trans children that the researcher found on anti-trans websites. From a methodological standpoint, it would be like doing polling on opinions on interracial relationships by finding people from Stormfront. Um, it, is, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is so invalid as to be like damaging to the credibility of people who even cite the study. Even, even using this term is a mark against the objectivity of this video because e a cursory look at the study's methodology for a person with any education on proper research, uh, which I assume this woman has, 
uh, should immediately make you go, oh, wow, I can't use that in my video. Adolescent girls get the idea from social media or their peers or both and come to believe they want to be men, hoping it'll improve their lives. Superficially, the hypothesis makes sense. According to data from the World Health... Superficially. Okay, so she's going to add on to this. ...organization, adolescent girls are twice as likely as boys to suffer from mental health problems such as depression and anxiety, so they're more likely to have a problem to solve in the first place. Littman speculates that girls that age are more vulnerable to social contagion than boys, though there's little evidence to back this up. Littman's paper was strongly criticized for not being scientific stuff. Nice. Okay. Very nice. Happy to hear this. ...but a collection of experience reports from parents. The parents were recruited among frequent visitors to websites who are skeptical that transgender self-identification among teenagers is genuine. Mm -hmm. This means the sample is unlikely to be representative. I, I think she should be harsher here. It's This isn't it's unlikely to be representative. It's we literally found we pre-selected for people who would agree with me it should be considered fully invalid. However, her pointing out that the study is invalid, I would have not mentioned it at all because there's no point, like the study has nothing to offer. Um, yeah, it's it's not a bad study. It's like a non-exist, it, do, it doesn't exist. Indeed, Littmann herself writes in a paper that it's a descriptive exploratory study. She describes what those parents say. What to conclude from that is a different story. A paper that came out in August last year claimed to have found evidence for the absence of this rapid onset symptom. However, this paper was also strongly criticized for severe shortcomings, such as, most importantly, for phrasing their survey questions in an ambiguous way and creative methods of interpreting their data. Mm. I don't know if I like... I, I, I don't like the, back, the equivocation that's being done here. Um, the... the, the the rapid onset gender dysphoria paper is so bad it would be like i don't know it's you you like you have to have some incredibly strong words against it what this is framing it as is like well you know people of people are arguing there is and isn't rapid onset gender dysphoria who can say when like no the term was created by a completely invalid study and a propagandist there's no it's there isn't like a debate on this it's not a real thing there's no reason to mention this outside gesturing at centrist objectivity. The brief summary of this controversy is that at the moment, there is no conclusive evidence neither for nor against the existence of rapid onset gender dysphoria, though it seems to be supported by anecdotal reports from doctors working in clinics who treat the children. Excuse me? This term that was just made up by a propaganda paper, well, no one can say if it's really or not, though it is supported by anecdotal reports. What, what anecdotal reports exactly? Are we going to go over this? This is, this is complete horseshit. The steep increase in the number of girls reporting gender dysphoria is how... That's it? Just, we're just going to say anecdotal reports? That we're just going to say that? Like, to, to give you guys a comparison, this would be like citing a, like, fake like completely nonsense race science paper suggesting that a group of researchers had found the warrior gene in black people and obviously the paper's completely made up and then you find one other paper that like criticizes the thesis but like there's problems there and you're like well nobody has found any evidence for or against the warrior gene but you know some people have said they've seen it in action and then moving on that is uh, that is unironically like what this is it's insane um that's how bad this is. That's, man. ...were clearly evident in the data. Another issue that physicians have brought up is that many of the adolescent children assigned female at birth who are now presenting with gender dysphoria have other psychological problems too. I wonder why. So what happens to those children who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria? The treatment regime is called gender-affirming care. It starts with the child adopting a new name and pronouns that fit their chosen gender. No, no, no. Gender-affirming care is just a blanket term. First of all, the use of the term regime is suspect there. Second of all, gender-affirming care is just a blanket term for psychiatric care with regards to gender that does not involve directly denying the purported gender identity of the person you're treating. The only thing gender-affirming care doesn't 
let you do, and the reason they don't let you do it is because it's been shown to not work, it's not good, is to say, uh, no, actually, you're wrong, you're not trans. But gender clinicians, if there's not a process where they begin with like, like they think you go into a gender clinic, it's like, oh, okay, well here, let's choose your new name. What? No? That's, okay. They begin to change their appearance and join groups that belong to that gender. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, n no, no. They can do that if they want. This is, the way she's making it sound is that this is like a prescribed medical thing. Like the doctor, the, the like, the doctor tells you, okay, time for you to grow your hair out and join the, the woman's soccer team. No, that's not how it works. Therapy in, by, by a gender clinician is usually just, you sit down and talk with them about your feelings and experiences, and the clinician tries to give you information and advice that helps you come to terms with your identity and what would make you happy. But it's, by definition, not a prescriptive process. Like, the doctor doesn't tell you what to do, say, or believe. Th that, th that's stupid. Am I coming off as pedantic here? I feel like this video took a nosedive, like, really quickly. For example, if you want to be a girl- I mean, she's trying to explain this to normies? Yeah, but she's wrong. I feel like the explanation I'm giving right now, even though it's not scripted and I'm kind of rambling because it's, you know, a live stream, I feel like I'm doing a fine enough job um, explaining these concepts. Like, that's not an excuse to be wrong. Oh, you joined the physics club. At the age of 10 or so, they begin taking puberty- Wait, what? If you oh that was a joke okay that was a joke that was cute sorry all right that took me that took me a second that was funny blockers, which are the, the joke is that she probably went to a physics club and she's a girl at the age she is I imagine her joining a physics club back when she was younger probably would have gotten her some flack yeah it was a joke okay which prevent the onset of puberty and stop the development of secondary sexual characteristics no. No, taking puberty blockers is not just an automatic part of gender-affirming care. It's not like an automatic thing that happens. If that was the case, why is there such a huge incongruity between the number of children in America who have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria and the number who are on puberty blockers? She just showed us numbers where there was several orders of magnitude difference between the number of gender dysphoric kids and the number of puberty blocking kids. So if this was just a part of the process, also 10 is incredibly early. It's not unheard of or whatever, but like not, that's I, that's like not the normal age to take puberty blockers from what I've heard. The onset of puberty and stop the development of secondary sexual characteristics such as breasts, body hair. Or she lacks nuance. No, no, no. In this case, she's being objectively wrong. She's not like, eh, getting this a little wrong. She's like, this is just lying. Gender affirming care is not your doctor tells you your new names and pronouns, makes you grow out your hair, sends you to different social groups, and then at 10 you're given puberty blockers. That's just not true. Or collections of sanitary pads from every possible brand in existence, which is what happened in our household. Puberty blockers are used to prevent the dysphoria from getting worse and also to give the children time to make up their mind. The medication is typically given as injections, either monthly or every three months, or through an implant placed under the skin of the upper arm, which needs to be replaced every 12 months. If the children and their parents wish to go forward, then at the age of 15 or so, they proceed with hormone therapy to induce puberty of the newly children. I just, I hate how, like, prescriptive this is sounding. Like, this is just the standard, like, every single, like, every single, like, dysphoric kid just, yeah, they go in, they get the diagnosis, they do all these things, at 10 they get the puberty blockers, then they get the horn. Like, no, that's just not true. There are people who are quite young who get hormone therapy in line with their doctor's recommendations, but the idea that this is some kind of standard regimen is just objectively not the case. I think you're being a bit harsh, Vouch. Well, we're talking about like, the, we're talking about like misinformation concerning the central subject of a genocide that's brewing against a minority group right now. I, I think it's okay to be, you know, specific. And what's more, this isn't just a little wrong. This is very wrong. And gender. This means those assigned male at birth take drugs to block testosterone and instead increase estrogen levels. Those assigned female at birth instead suppress estrogen and take testosterone. 
At least in previous cohorts, most children who took puberty blockers continued with hope. I don't know, it seems like you're reacting more towards her delivery than her message. Wait, am I getting trolled right now? Everything that she's been saying for the past minute has been wrong. I have no idea what... Chat, if you like this YouTuber, okay, then, I don't know, go, like, do deal with that yourself. That's between you and the, the f pastor at the Catholic Church. Go confess yourself. I don't care. I'm not interested in your opinions on this, okay? She's wrong. That's not opinions. That's a fact. And there's a difference between, like, petty incorrectness that you can be pedant, like, a pedant about. That's, you know, that happens. But this is, like, come on. This is a science YouTuber. She's apparently held in high regard. I don't think it's unreasonable of me to expect a certain degree of care and caution when talking about an issue of this level of social importance. I'm not being too demanding here. She's just saying stuff that's wrong. Hormone therapy. According to estimates from the Netherlands, as much as 95%. Some of them might eventually choose surgery to reshape genitals and breasts or remove internal organs. But surgeries are almost always delayed until adult age. They are basically unheard of in children and are very rare in teens. The American healthcare system isn't exactly known for being affordable, so you won't be surprised to hear that the costs for gender-affirming care in the US can be substantial. Costs for hormone therapy are typically $100 to $200 a month, plus expenses for the doctor's visits and the counseling. Surgery starts at $3,000 to $10,000 for top surgery, whereas bottom surgery typically costs around $25,000. And let's be clear that those innocent-sounding euphemisms mean they're cutting off parts of the anatomy that'll never come back. Ye yes. So there's a bit of that narrativization as well. The idea that the term bottom surgery is some kind of sinister ploy to cover up the extremely secret knowledge that bottom surgery means cutting your dick. It doesn't, first of all, it doesn't even mean cutting your dick off. It does a loop de loop, okay? It's, it's, it's not even cutting, it doesn't cut the dick off. It does a loop de loop, okay? Um, it's very complicated. Uh, 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 and, but second of all, like, why add this unless you're like, like, if she's doing the science reading bit, why wouldn't she just say, to be clear, bottom surgery means turning a penis into a vagina or a vagina into a penis. Why wouldn't she just say that? As opposed to this, like, fear-mongering bullshit. This is only the cost for the surgery itself, not the care they'll need afterwards. There are no reliable numbers on the total cost, but experience reports that you find online say the total expenses for gender affirming care can exceed 100,000 US dollars, even with insurance coverage. Isn't that about the cost of having a kid? Like, not through their life, but like the first couple of years? It's, it's more than 100,000 for the full 18 years or something. It's a lot. Um, I don't know exactly. It's a lot of money, sure. I think it should be free. Okay, so some people are making a lot of money with this. Okay. All right. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, but so much of the concern, like we saw this with Ollie London the other day, where it's like, mm, these clinics and their profit motive. Well, yeah, it's the American healthcare system. It's not really a trans specific thing. She could just be making a statement about America and not a statement about these surgeries specifically. But, I don't know, in the, in the context of the discourse. Does it at least work? Puberty blockers work in the sense that they block puberty. True. Side effects include, but are not limited to, weight gain, headaches, reduced growth, and a significant decrease in bone density. Oh, oh do we, we're going to go over everything here, aren't we? From, from my understanding, um, the, the process of taking hormone blockers, it, like, every medication can lead to side effects. Like, go look at the back of your aspirin bottle. As I understand it, um, puberty blockers don't really rough your body up that much. What's more, it does not lead to a significant decrease in bone density. Uh, the lack of hormones in your body, because you're taking puberty blockers, um, can lead to a temporary reduction in your growth and your bone density that gets compensated for by then taking hormones or just not taking the puberty blockers and getting your regular hormones back. Um, so yes, puberty is a biological process that makes you big and strong. So when you take the drugs that keep you from experiencing puberty, it prevents you from being big and strong. But that's why it's temporary, and then you take hormones or just go back to your regular hormones. So the vast majority of people who take puberty blockers go on to uh, take hormones as well. 
The effects of those drugs are often described as being reversible in the sense that normal development resumes once children stop taking them. But this is a dangerous oversimplification. Oh, no. There are few long-term studies on people who have been taking puberty blockers. We've been using them since the 1980s. They were used... They were used on children with rapid onset puberty as young as 8, 9, 10 years old. We've studied their effects. They, we've known for decades. We know what they do. We know what they do. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to need a 50-year longitudinal analysis on, uh, on, 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 these, on these children before we can know. She's a physicist. She doesn't know shit about biology. Okay, but the only places you would get this kind of misinformation from are anti-trans sources. I have a feeling that she's, like, checked out a bunch of research documents that have been compiled by so-called centrists who do the Ollie London thing, where they're like, oh, we love trans people, we just have legitimate concerns, blah, 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 blah. And she's trying to find a middle ground between an incorrect right-wing side and a correct left-wing side. But those that exist show that bone density is unlikely to entirely recover. Oh, okay, where's that study? God damn it. Do we really have to do this? This study, somebody find me that chart. The one how bone density recovers after you get off the puberty blockers or start taking hormones, in which case you get off the puberty blockers. This, the, the, the bone density chart. Where's the bone density chart? God damn it. It's in the description. I don't want her... Th I don't know what she has down there. I mean, the, the objective study on the subject. Somewhere out there. I'm checking my doc. Do I even have it in here? I don't even think I have it in my thing. Chart. Effects on... Bone density, puberty blockers. It's like a couple of lines next to each other based on different cases. It's a chart. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm illiterate. I can't read words. I have to see, um, I have to see a chart. Where's that chart? Why is it not in the doc? I don't know. You put it in there. Shut up. Uh, somebody finds it, let me know. It does have to be added in there. Oh my god, these words. Which means a lifelong increase of the risk to break bones. Others okay, by what amount? If there was like a... T oh, okay. If you could talk to like... If you could talk to like a trans person and be like, Hey, you get to... Okay, here you go, hypothetical trans woman. You get to take medicine that will prevent you from having ever experienced a male puberty. Uh, body hair, facial hair, wide shoulders, Adam's apple. You don't have to worry about any of it, okay? Um, none of that will be a problem for you. You get to be a young shit. And the, the, the consequence, the, the, the like trade-off here, is that you have a 2% higher likelihood of breaking your arm at one point in your life. Who wouldn't take that deal? <laughs> they all would. Every one of them. So by what amount are we talking? Man, I wish I could find that chart. I think, didn't Merrick link it once? Or maybe it was SDL? I don't remember. Studies have suggested that taking puberty blockers increases the risk of heart problems and may result in genital underdevelopment or fertility complications. Okay, wow. All right. First of all, I haven't heard anything about the risk of heart problems. That is just not something that I've heard about. So unless I'm shown a reason to believe that's real, I don't think that's real. And second of all, Genital underdevelopment or fertility complications. They block puberty. You're describing a feature, not a bug. Though I have to warn you that at the moment, none of those studies are particularly conclusive because the sample sizes are small. Really? Well, Good to know we're filling our videos with nothing but the most uh, you know, pressing and relevant analyses on this hot button issue. More. On top of this comes the psychological problem that not entering puberty when all your peers do isn't easy to cope with either. In 2016, the American Food and Drug Administration ordered makers of puberty blockers to add a warning about mental health problems to the drug's label after they received several reports of suicidal thoughts in children who were taking them. Yes, uh, drug manufacturers will add literally anything to the warning label on the back of their bottle. 
because that is what they do. Again, look at your local aspirin thing. I, I have some uh, naproxen sodium for my costochondritis thing. Um, hold on. Does it have the big warning list here, or would that have been on the box that I got it in? Increase the risk of heart attack, heart failure, and stroke. Well, shit! I can't believe the deep state is keeping people from knowing that mild fever reducers can lead to, um... Symptoms may include hives, facial swelling, skin reddening, re just... Uh, it's like... Guys, we've heard reports that some of the teenagers that take your drugs may or may not be feeling suicidal. We don't have any studies to secure a correlation, but let's get that added. Why, why don't we? Why not get suicidal thoughts added to, like, um, Flintstone vitamin gummies? Those are for kids. I bet lots of kids have suicidal thoughts, and they take Flintstone vitamin gummies. Huh? Let's just ca call it up. Time for big Flintstone to pay for their crimes against the mental wellness of young people. Being born might cause you to die. Many people are saying this. So clearly you want to have a good reason to put your child through this. Oh, the narrativization. Hey, here is a bunch of medical complications associated with puberty blockers. They're not conclusive because the study sizes are small. And also I made some of this stuff up. Also, did you know some children have had suicidal thoughts? There was no study proving any kind of causative factor from the puberty blockers, even though they've been used since the 1980s. Uh, but you know, uh, so that's also the thing. So yeah, basically, if you give your child puberty blockers, they like die instantly. You know, it's up to you. Yes. Unfortunately, the evidence that puberty blockers actually improve the mental health of children presenting with gender dysphoria is slim. Oh yeah? Do you want to substantiate that? I have, I've talked to a decent number of people who have taken hormone blockers before getting their like puberty, the hormone or whatever, and I don't think I've ever talked to a single one who had anything but positive. They all want to be young shits. Some studies have found a small benefit in the reduction of suicidal tendencies, but these studies didn't have control groups, so the benefit might have come simply from receiving a treatment and being cared for. Other studies have found that puberty blockers given to kids with severe and persistent gender dysphoria had no significant effect on thoughts of self-harm or body image. Where? Just, I want to see that study. I would love to see the methodology on that one. Transcript and references on Patreon. Really? She paywalls her sources. Well, how much is it? I'm not giving her a cent. The UK's National Institute for Health did a systematic review of the literature in 2020 and found that the results of the reviewed studies were of very low certainty and that the studies suggest little change with puberty blockers from baseline to follow up. Okay. You all realize that puberty blockers on their own don't fix anything, right? Like, the literal point of puberty blockers is to stop your body from changing, i.e. to keep it as is. If there is a 10-year-old with gender dysphoria, them taking puberty blockers won't make things better, it'll just prevent them from getting worse. That's the point. The puberty blockers on their own aren't meant to fix gender dysphoria, they're meant to prevent it from getting worse when you experience a puberty that causes your body to, uh, to change in ways that, that, that make you nice feel arguments. Worse. Oh, sorry. Somebody provided the source. Nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the f*** up. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, somebody, somebody ripped a, um, a transcript of the source list. Wow, this is quite long. Okay, hold on. All right, let's take a look. In 2016, the American Food and Drug Administration ordered makers of puberty blockers to add a warning about mental health problems to the drug's label after they received several reports of suicidal thoughts in children who were taking them. Oh. Oh my god. Oh my god, the citation is that awful Reuters article that we spent two and a half hours tearing into on stream. The one that left- that's the source? This isn't a source. This is a, this is an editorial. It's a narrative. We, oh, I'm glad uh, whoever linked this, this is, this is going to be great. Thank you very much. We tore through this. I streamed two hours later on this day because this article is so f terrible. It's basically like here, we're going to focus on the story of a young trans girl for whom everything is going right. 
Now, let me explain how despite that, actually being trans is terrible and every effort made to help trans people is actually abuse. And then there's, and then you have like the girl and everything's going fine with her. Well, I mean, obviously she's like trans in the Midwest or whatever, so not everything's going fine, but like, you know, it would not have been better denying her the healthcare she wanted. Okay, so that's one source down. Other studies have found that puberty blockers given to kids with severe and persistent gender dysphoria had no significant effects on, um, on um, self-harm or body image. Why would puberty blockers have an effect on body image when the thing that puberty blockers does is keep the image of your body from changing? What are you talking about? That's the point. Here, hold on. I'm trying to open up the BMJ article. You full text? You have to log in. Or subscribe for 173 pounds. That's also an option. Puberty blockers used to treat children aged 12. A study is found. A study is found. What study? Give me, give me the study. Why is she linking a study on a study and not the study? Where's the study? Oh god, is every source going to be like this? Just, just give me a second. Oh, here's the... Rapid onset gender dysphoria thing from Littman. Okay, hold on. Where's this where's this study? On reading the study mentioned in the first paragraph. Wait, this is a letter from the editor. Participant experience of tri Wait. This is a response to the original article, which I can't read because it's behind a paywall. So this is somebody officially replying to the paper that is being cited in this god awful video. Dear editor. Participant experience of treatment as reported in interviews was positive for the majority, particularly relating to feeling happier, more comfortable, having better relationships with family and peers, and positive changes in gender role. This does not match the claim made in the title. If the majority of participants expressed more positive emotions, then it is counterintuitive to say it has no effect on negative thoughts. Further explanation from the authors discusses the differences in evaluating the sole effect of puberty blockers on mood since the social environment and relationships participants form with others is a significant factor in mood. This complexity makes it difficult to ascertain the actual impact of puberty blockers on psychological well-being. On discussing the limitations of the study, the authors explored the qualitative aspects of their feelings. A more detailed qualitative experience of participant experience was not or evaluation of participant experience was not possible due to lack of interviewer time oh oh had a had to rush this paper out did we not lack of interviewee time lack of interviewer time and reporting of interview data was restricted to perceptions of positive and negative change the giving of examples it highlights the importance of qualitative data to build in the study and optimize patient experience in the future moreover it recognizes that the difference between changes in mood and psychological well-being in patients isn't universal these participants have family with different opinions different relation to gender and different aims from transitioning it's important to recognize the impact of headlines, even if the content of the article is an update on a legal situation. Since very few people read the study, interpretation of studies in mainstream news play a significant role in swaying public opinion. Speaking of people not reading the f study, oh my god, dude. Wow, this video is incredible. The UK's National Institute for Health did a systemic review of the literature in 2020 and found the results of the reviewed studies were of very low certainty. Okay, pretty sure I've heard of this before. Gonadotrophin releasing hormone analysis which has asked less. 131 pages. Nice. Where is that conclusion, baby? 45? Okay, yep. We don't have time for all this shit. Page 45. The results of the studies that were reported impact on the critical hospitals for mental health, the important outcomes, body image, and of low certainty using modified gray. They suggest little change with uh, GNRH analogs for based follow-up. Questionable clinical value studies are not reliable in change modes. It's plausible, however, that a lack of difference in scores from baseline to follow-up in the effect of GNRH analogs in children and adolescents to gender dysphoria, so there's an increased impact on gender dysphoria and determined time and stay the baseline to follow-up given the person. The results of these studies that reported bone density outcomes suggest that GNRH analogs may reduce the increase in bone density, which is expected during puberty. However, as the studies themselves are not reliable, the results could be due to confounding bias or chance. While controlling trials may not be possible, comparative studies are need to understand the association. So literally all this is saying is that more research needs to be done on the subject. There's not the, the conclusion of this giant report that was prepared on 
Turf Island as part of their master strategy to kill all trans people doesn't even include a portion where they say, hey, the evidence says this is bad. It just says there needs to be more research. But they want to take away the ability to do research because they're trying to make it legally impossible to even do the things that they would then research. Cool. Well, back to this. That was her claim in the, vi in the video that the evidence is inconclusive. Yeah, after lying and misciting previous sources that are all built to lead to the conclusion that this isn't good for kids. They liter she literally said like, wow, you'd better have a lot of good evidence to put your kid through this. And by put them through this, what she meant was like bullshit. This, this is highly narrativized. This is disgusting. I, th I thought just once, just once, I could have like a response video or a review video of transphobic or at least not pro-trans uh, academic stuff and have it like an actual battle of the minds here, you know? Like she could she could be like, okay, well, here's like a bunch of really interesting data. I'd be like, oh, I haven't seen that. I have to look at but no, it's the same bullshit as ever. And it will never change because I'm right. I'm never not going to be on this. My conclusions are the definitive result of the science that we have at present. I'm not going to get a good argument on the subject because there are no good arguments. It will never change. I'm always, this is just like a scientific veneer over the same panicked fear mongering that I hear from literally anything else. Guys, how much of a difference is there, fundamentally, I mean, between this video and what we were hearing from Ali London? The honest truth is not much. Obviously, Ali London is an outright fascist or at least a mouthpiece for them. And this lady's, I don't think she's a fascist. I think she's just a centrist who doesn't know much about trans issues. Um, I don't know if she's anti-trans or not. I don't think she's a fascist at all, though. That's not my impression of this video. Um, but on the fundamentals, we're, we're reinforcing this exact same panic narrative. The same fundamental misinformation gets repeated in both cases. It's, if anything, a difference in tone more than content. All right, well, there's still more to go through in gender dysphoria, mental health, and psychosocial impact. They also say that, quote, studies that found differences in outcomes could represent changes that are either of questionable clinical value or the studies themselves are not reliable and changes could be due to confounding bias or chance, end quote. Let's then look at hormone therapy that replaces the hormones of the assigned gender with that of the chosen gender. Of course, we do have a ton of research of the effect of long-term hormone, uh, 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 you know, taking. So, you know, is she going to do the same thing? Is she going to be like, well, you know, we don't really know because we, we do know on this. This is usually done at the age of 16 to 18 or so, so much later than the usual onset of puberty. Man, if you listen to her, you would think every trans is a young shit, huh? That's kind of wild, right? Like, it, it... When hormone therapy is later discontinued, some characteristics such as skin texture, muscle mass, and fat deposition are partly reversible. Others are not. Adam's apple protrusion, voice changes, male pattern baldness, and breast development are irreversible once developed. Yeah, once your hair's gone, even as... Um... No? Testosterone will lower your voice, even if you experience female puberty. And I'm pretty sure I've heard that taking estrogen I, reduces male pattern baldness, like, like it just stops it. Um, as for breast development, if you have a male puberty and then take estrogen, you can grow breasts. I don't know what you mean by like, this isn't changeable. When hormone therapy is later, okay, let me, when hormone therapy is later discontinued, so if you take estrogen but then stop, some characteristics are partially reversible, others are not. Okay, okay, I think she's saying that if you take estrogen and you develop male pattern baldness, you can't unbald your head, which, yeah. And if you take estrogen for a while but then stop, you can't untitty your titty. Okay. And as for voice changes, you can absolutely change your voice. Stop smiling. Um, you, you ever hear, like, transphobes love to do this. They're like, did you know that taking estrogen can cause irreversible changes in your body? Really? I'm sure the millions of people who take it didn't know that. That's definitely not the reason they started. Development are irreversible once developed. Yeah, once your hair's gone, even estrogen won't make it come back. Yo. Y okay, yeah. Um. Sorry, guys. The effects of hormone therapy on fertility are presently unclear.
No, they're, they're pretty clear. It negatively affects it. Trans people know that. They, they, they know this. Why do people pretend like, uh, did you know? Hey, hey, a uh, trans woman who just got bottom surgery. Did you know that might negatively affect your fertility? Really? They're not going to be shooting fat ropes anymore? That's crazy. If only a doctor had told them that before they paid $25,000 to make their dick do a loop-de-loop. -loop. Does it benefit the well-being of transgender people? Oh, no. Just a few months ago, a team of American researchers published the results of a study on gender-affirming hormone therapy in adolescents. They followed 315 transgender and non-binary participants aged 12 to 20 for two years. In the abstract, they claim they found an increase in reported appearance congruence, that is, how well the participants felt their gender aligned with their appearance, positive effect, and life satisfaction. Just to be clear, we have like a billion studies on the effects of hormone therapy with regards to happiness, lowered suicide rates, uh, decreased gender dysphoria, uh, 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 longer life expectancy, and low regret rates. Like, we have so much. They also found a decrease of depression and anxiety symptoms. These decreases are statistically significant, but that doesn't mean they're large. Life satisfaction, for example, increased by 2.3 points per year on a 100-point scale, and depression scores decreased by 1.3 points per year on a 63-point scale. Okay. I mean, we're talking about 18 to 20-year-olds for two years, so they're already at the point in life where people are experiencing, like, the highest levels of life fluctuation, uncertainty, dissatisfaction, confusion, and mental illness. I mean, we, we literally have studies that, like, look at pe the effects that hormones have in people's lives over decades, like, lots of them. We have meta-analyses on dozens and dozens of studies to this effect that show uniformly positive effects. So it's like, well, here, we're going to cherry-pick this one study, and then we're going to say, like, oh, yeah, for this already, like, mentally, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, complicated point in your life. For this one specific window, we see a positive increase across the board, but like only a bit. By 2.3 points per year on a 100 point scale and depression scores decreased by 1.3 points per year on a 63 point scale. You might say that's better than nothing, but these numbers in and of themselves don't tell you anything because the study didn't have a control group. Oh my God, you don't, well, listen. When you do control groups for trans people taking hormones, the control group that you do is people who aren't taking the hormones. We, I'm going to my research document. This is ridiculous. I know people get bored when I start like flexing documents or whatever, but this is insane. Here we go. Meta-analysis of 27 studies on patient regret rates following gender-affirming gender surgery of which of nearly 8,000 patients surveyed, only 77 or 1% reported regret. Uh, here. Surveys to surgeons asking for opinions from patients. Total patients affected between 18 and 27,000. Regret rate was 62. Not 62%, 62 or 0.2 to 0.3%. Here we go. This one, regret rate, reversal rate, 0.3%. Whenever the f that one decides to load. Okay, hold on. Jesus Christ. Gender transition positive effect. All right, here we go. Meta-analysis of 26 studies. Wait, not 26. I'm dumb. 56 studies. 52 indicating transitioning has a positive effect on the mental health of trans people, and 4 indicating mixed or no results. Zero studies indicating no effect. Longitudinal study. Oh, longitudinal study. That's, wow, longitudinal? That's what we're talking about. You know, like, over time? What's the methodology here? A total of 55 young trans people, 22 trans women, 33 trans uh, men. Puberty suppression was assessed three times. Before the start of puberty suppression, mean age 13.6 years. When cross-sex hormones were introduced, mean age 16.7 years. And at least one year after gender reassignment surgery, mean age 20.7 years. Psychological functioning, body image, global functioning, gender dysphoria, depression, anxiety, emotional behavioral problems, and objective social education, professional functioning, and subjective well-being were investigated. The results, all of them improved. 
Wow. Improvements in psychological functioning were positively correlated with post-surgical subjective well-being. Damn, that they got the whole nine yards in there. They got the hormone blockers, the, the hormones, and the surgery. That's crazy. Wow, self-reported effects from people who undergo... Oh, this is also surgery. Sex reassignment surgery. Most of them said, woo, feeling way better. That's great. Where's the... Where's the, the other hormone one? Quality of life raises dramatically with gender-affirming treatment. Whoa. From the National Library of Medicine. That's crazy. Analyze data regarding quality of life in the transgender population. Does transitioning help transgender people? <laughs> uh, it's a meta-analysis of how many papers? How many papers were involved? 29 studies were included within the review and data extraction for meta-analyses available in 14 studies. All right, what were the conclusions? That's crazy. That's so many big numbers. Quit making me scroll through things I don't want to scroll through. Conclusion, conclusion, conclusion. Where is it? Where is it? Discussion. I'm bored. We'll read the summary for my own paper. Thank you. Longitudinal study. However, the quality of life raises dramatically with gender-affirming treatment. Damn! That's crazy. Did I quote dramatically, or did they use the term dramatically? I did not. I used the term dramatically. Where's the actual numbers here? Longitudinal studies, amelioration of body image, quality of life, in terms of... Oh my god, there are so many numbers. Conclusion. Gender affirming therapy is linked to gender more positive or quality of life in trans men and trans women post GAT. Yeah, right there. Shown to improve post GAT, quality of life. Just, I. I'm sorry, I know that was a lot. It's just like. I can't believe she's pretending we don't have research that shows that hormones have a positive... Talk to any trans person. D whatever, just... We're gonna d end up doing this forever. Many previous studies have found that life satisfaction in this age group on average declines, which makes you think they either had a non-representative sample to begin with, or the fact of being treated itself had a positive effect. If you look closer at their data, it also turns out that the researchers only saw the psychological improvements for anxiety, depression, and life satisfaction among those designed female at birth, but not among those designed male at birth, a fact that, interestingly enough, isn't mentioned in the abstract. The authors speculate that the reason may be- As I said, we have an overwhelming body of evidence on this subject. I don't feel there's any worth in continuing to point this out that they only followed the participants for two years, but it usually takes longer for trans girls to grow breasts of a decent size. So maybe it just takes longer for the benefits to become apparent. They also point out that social acceptance of trans women and trans men is different. Maybe that's the right explanation, or maybe not. As we've seen previously, young women on average suffer from more mental health problems than boys. And a 2019 meta-analysis of 27 randomized placebo-controlled trials found that testosterone treatment is associated with a significant reduction in depressive symptoms in men. So maybe the hormones did it, but does it have anything to do with a gender transition? Another issue pointed out by Jesse Singer is... Well, that's a sentence you love to hear in an objective scientific assessment of transgender issues oh yeah trans researcher jesse single is that the variables analyzed in the paper are not those they'd said they'd analyze in the pre-registered protocol this means they had an opportunity to cherry pick their results which makes their measure of statistical significance obsolete i'm not saying that that's what they did but since they didn't adhere to the protocol, which they themselves pre-registered, it's a possibility that their results are just random noise. Another paper that is often presented by people favoring hormone treatment is one that was published in 2022 in the journal Pediatrics. They followed about 100 young Americans that were either transgender or non-binary, or at least they tried. By the end of the trial, only 64 were left. So we're talking about a really small sample. It's just really curious to me why she's not bringing up any of the studies that I just mentioned that have sample sizes in the thousands. It's just, it's really interesting to me why, like, there's so much research on this and just coincidentally, somehow, she's managing to find these tiny ones she has specific issues with. About two-thirds of the participants began a therapy either with puberty blockers or gender-affirming hormones during the trial. The remainder served as a control group.
The researchers observed 60% lower odds of depression and 73% lower odds of suicidal thoughts among youths who had initiated puberty blockers or hormone therapy compared with those who had not. They saw no effect for anxiety. In case that sounds good, here's the fine print. The mental health of those who were treated did not improve. What happened instead is that the mental health of those who were not treated got worse. Wow. Okay. Remember earlier when we said that the point of puberty blockers is to keep things from getting worse? And in the end, the untreated control group totaled seven people. I know as a particle physicist, I may be used to unreasonably high standards of statistical significance and sample size, but I'm not impressed. Aren't there any- Well, yeah, because you're deliberately choosing to, you're, yeah, AI art. You're deliberately choosing studies that have small sample sizes and avoiding ones that have large sample sizes. Also, yeah, you can see it right here, but this, the, the other group isn't framed as an official control group. Um, they have a baseline and then the longitudinal analysis where they have people who have and then have not yet gone through the, um, the procedures that are being looked at. But they're not framed as a control, a control group. It's just a what is the effect of these procedures on these people over time. She's completely full of shit on this part. Rebecca Watson has a brief segment going over how this person is completely misrepresenting this study. But even with the absolute basics of mental health resources and puberty blockers, plus the option to go on hormones, the evidence is simply overwhelming. But Hassenfelder dismisses them for often having a lack of a control group. She does address one of the studies I mentioned earlier, the one that showed a 73% reduction in suicidality, but she dismisses it for two reasons. First, because she points out that the mental health of the kids in treatment didn't improve so much as the mental health of the kids who didn't get treatment was way worse. It declined significantly. Sabine, we, we call that a control group. You were literally just complaining about the lack of a control group in other studies. That's a control group. And that is a valid result. Kids who don't get this treatment, their mental health goes all to shit. The kids that do get the treatment maintain their mental health. That's good. That's a good. That's that's evidence of good in that treatment. The second reason she dismisses it, uh, she circles this uh, on the screen to point out that the untreated control group at the end of the study consisted of only seven people, which is a very small number. And um, also this is super disingenuous because the researchers noted that depressive symptoms and suicidality were twofold to threefold higher than baseline levels at three and six months of follow-up as well, not just at the end of the study. And those groups had 38 and 24 people respectively. Out of 108 total subjects, that's a perfectly valid amount for a control group that is obviously going to get progressively smaller as the study goes on and as more of those kids finally enter into care. But I want to point out, by the way, that when you're talking about like highly qualitative studies that factor in stuff like mental health care and wellness, it's not at all uncommon for longitudinal studies to have a small number of people. Do you think longitudinal studies, which require like multiple follow ups, visits, consultations, interviews, uh, writing down like non specific answers, trying to parse them, getting numbers, all that, do you think they run those for 20,000 people? Studies that have enormous sample sizes are usually studies that are like, like pull doctors to pull info from patients that have already done a thing or not, or they like, it's like a one and done kind of thing. Longitudinal studies will often have smaller numbers of people. And I think the problem that we're running into here is that we have a bunch of grifting f who will simultaneously ignore the existing research we have in the subject and will then lie about the smaller studies and pretend that longitudinal studies over the course of one year are somehow invalid because the consistent results found across that year at times have only seven people in one group or another. Um, it's like, it's, it's just so disingenuous. In the end, the untreated control group totaled seven people. Keep in mind, Control groups are meant to do different things. If you're trying to test whether or not a medicine is safe, you want a control group of an enormous number of people because uh, you want, or, or sorry, you want an enormous sample size because it's possible that like you get a hundred people and it like lucks out and nobody gets sick, but you have a thousand and then some people do get sick or whatever, right? Even 10,000. Um, depending on how like large the margin of risk is, you might need a very high sample size. But when you're doing a longitudinal study where the point is comparing people to them past selves, guys, the past you 
is the control group. That's the point of the longitudinal study in many cases. In this case, it's both your past self and the people who haven't yet gotten on the study. The goals of the research aren't, can, is anyone in this group going to experience a negative outcome? It's what is the average outcome of this group? This isn't just her being specific because she's a physicist. I'm sorry. Uh, th this is a shocking level of ignorance from a person who pretends to have an understanding of research methodology. This is not like high specificity. She's just wrong. Here's a transphobic tweet that she uh, tweeted. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily transphobic. It's just dumb. Just low IQ. Pope allows women to vote at upcoming bishops meeting. Looking forward to the first non-binary pope. Like, it's the kind of stupid thing that a right-winger would tweet, but it also might just be the kind of stupid thing one of you guys would tweet. So, I don't know. She doesn't give me, like, she doesn't give me fascist vibe. She just gives me, like, she's kind of stupid and self-important. Guys, physicists and STEM majors are socially unaware, emotionally unintelligent blowhards who are dwarfed intellectually by people who do work in sociology, criminology, and linguistics, and will never understand how out of their depth they are. This is why every time you see a STEM lord on Twitter talk about how you could solve society by putting AI in charge of our criminal justice system, you're like, wow, you're like, how is it that you can code programs and you're this, f how the f can you possibly understand how to write code? And like, and this, is, and this is where you are. Like, you have no idea what's going on in the world. It's like Elon Musk brain. She's a boomer pill contrarian. She does this stuff in her own field as well. She's not even liked by other STEM people. That's how bad she is. Well, we did see a video of hers down here. That's literally I her saying, shut up. That's literally her saying, um, I think faster than light travel is possible. Here's why. And again, not a physicist, but I can't imagine any reason why a video like this would be made if not for contrarianism. Oh God, no, this, the whole channel is full of this. Dopamine addiction is a myth. Here's what the science says. Clickbait title. Collective stupidity, how can we avoid it? I guarantee you this video is trash. I believe chatbots understand part of what they say. Let me explain it. This is, this is nonsense. This is jibber jabber. These are, these are inflammatory contrarian titles that are designed to incite controversy and get rage views. Not to say all of them are necessarily bad. And why are you on the phone? The phone wouldn't even work on the moon. Idiot. I knew that and she didn't. That's a landline. I know as a particle physicist, I may be used to unreasonably high standards of statistical significance and sample size, but I'm not impressed. Are there any better studies? No, there are not. Oh yeah, sorry. This guy is five fingers. <laughs> yeah, you always got to check with the AI art. There you go. There are at present no high quality studies that conclusively demonstrate these treatments are beneficial. Yes, there are. We just looked at them. I'm not going over them again. The British National Health Service looked at this in 2020 and found evidence from five observational studies. This was the one that had the response from the editor where, 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 they, where they were like, um, hey, I can't help but notice that the title is lying. Or this is evidence review, but the paper itself had that criticism. Which suggests that gender affirming hormones are likely to improve symptoms of gender dysphoria and may also improve depression, anxiety, quality of life, suicidality, and psychological functioning. But they point out that those studies didn't have control groups and that all results were of very low certainty. Isn't it crazy how these people are pretending to be objective when they're looking at a body of research that at most they can say needs more research and the response isn't, wow, we should do more research? Because she's literally like, okay, so we have a bunch of small studies that show that there's a positive impact, but like they're not super high quality. And her response to this isn't like, wow, we should study this more. Can you imagine if we instantly stopped every medical treatment that initially showed to have promise, but hadn't an done enough to like study? Like imagine every time we come up with a new like kind of procedure, it's like, oh, well, it looks like it's good, but we'll never know because you can't do it because we haven't done enough times to know if it's good. What? An often made comparison is that between transgender identity and left-handedness, which was recently popularized by the British comedian John Oliver. Until the 1970s or so, children were forced to learn to write with their right hand until it occurred to someone to just let them write as they wanted. Rather suddenly, a lot of people switched to writing with the other hand. This had nothing to do with social contagion. It was just that now they could be who they had wanted to be all along. 
You expect a similar thing to happen with transgender identification, that as it becomes socially more acceptable, you see more people being comfortable being who they really are. And so the argument goes, no one would put themselves or their children through a gender transition if they didn't think it was really necessary. All right, here's the but. But for one thing, this doesn't mm. explain why the gender ratio of those seeking treatment for gender dysphoria has suddenly changed. Yeah, it doesn't explain it, but that's not like an own. That's that doesn't so so it just it doesn't explain it because it doesn't explain it's not that's not a subject that it's discuss like talking about. It's not like an unaccounted for variable. You could easily explain why there's a different um gender ratio of treatment. Maybe it's because um uh, uh there's less social stigma for being a transgender guy than there is a transgender girl. Huh? Like if you're born male, and then you start adopting feminine traits, that's a quick trip to the asphalt of your local school's parking lot, bucko, as the bullies kick you into the dirt. But if you're born female and you're like, yeah, I want short hair and like, I want to like, you know, wear more masculine clothes. What does that mean? A t-shirt and jeans? No hate to trans guys. Not saying you don't get shit. You do. But I'm pretty sure that when you're young, it's probably a lot more approachable. The idea of what, you know, for all effects and purposes to the broader, like, perception, looking and acting like a tomboy than, like, a little feminine boy. You know what I mean? Like, th like there you go. Wow, I just found an explanation, potentially. Okay, wow. Prove me wrong, huh? And also, as much as I like John Oliver, it's an extremely unfortunate comparison. You can switch a pen from one hand to the other and back within a few seconds and without lasting consequences. What? The... The treatment of left-handed people wasn't just you can switch the pen. They were religiously castigated. They were socially discriminated against. They were forced for years to write with the wrong hands. That's not what the analogy means. Uh, hey, well, did you know all you have to do, you can just switch your name again. All transgender stuff doesn't matter because you can just go like, oh yeah, I was Billy and then I was uh, Michelle and now I'm Billy again. Wow, that was that easy. They, yeah, they were beaten if they wrote with the left hand because it was considered satanic. What are you, uh, bro, just switch hands, bro, just switch hands, forehead. Just switch hands, forehead, idiot. Like, li this is so dumb. This is so stupid. I will never respect anything this woman has to say. I will, it's unbelievable to me that there were people in chat who were like, uh, I think you're being nitpicky and biased. Bye-bye. Like, Oh my god. Dude, so just switch pens, man. Why, why didn't all the people in the Catholic schools in 1907 not just switch hands? Jesus Christ. Puberty blockers and hormone therapies are not as easy to undo. That's not... The thing that you're trying to prevent with the left hand in this thing isn't the physical pen. I've had pens in my left hand even though I'm right-handed before. It's not where the pen is, it's the decades of social ostracization. That... that you. Bro, just switch the hand of the decades of social ostracization. You're right. It's time. This is insane. I can't believe this shit. And we don't understand the long-term consequences. We do. We have data that goes on for decades and decades and decades. Thank you. In summary, what I take away from the data is that the sudden increase in the number of teenagers identifying as transgender is both real and substantial. It's also clear that the demographic group is markedly shifting, now heavily skewed towards those assigned female at birth. Is that um, skew towards the um, more trans guys? Is that just in the UK or is that everywhere? I've heard about that a lot in the UK, but it's always that one UK poll that I see. I don't see it in the United States. many of which present with other mental health disorders. Evidence that those children would benefit from puberty blockers or hormone therapy is slim. Untrue. Again, this is just a lie. This is not like a misinterpretation or a mistake. It is just a lie. You can literally go on Google Scholar and Google, like, effects of hormone blockers. And you uh, You know what? Hold on. Let me make it really clear to everyone how easy it is Trans effects of hormone therapy. A systemic review of the effects of hormone therapy on psychological functioning and quality of life in transgender individuals. A systemic review, huh? 
Well, let's see how much, uh, how much we're looking at here. Three uncontrolled prospective cohort studies enrolling 127 trans adults. Oh, is that not enough? By the way, 247 trans, uh, people is significantly more than plenty of reputable psychological um, studies. Plenty, plenty, plenty more. The studies measured exposure to hormone therapy, subsequent changes in mental health, quality of life outcomes, and follow-up. Two studies showed significant improvement in psychological functioning at three to six months and 12 months compared to, with baseline after initiating hormone therapy. So remember, for longitudinal studies, oftentimes the baseline is the control group. The third study showed improvements in quality of life outcomes 12 months after initiating hormone therapy for uh, female to male and male to female participants. However, only male to female participants showed a statistically significant increase in general quality of life. That's the study she was referring to. That's one of three studies listed here, all of which just show positive effects. Admittedly, the positive effects in one study for one group were less, but still present. So, okay, let's find another one. That was the first one on the results, right up there. Metabolic effects of hormone therapy and trans... What do you mean metabolic? Adverse anthropomorphic or metabolic effects. Oh, is I think this is like a medical thing. Triglycerides did not show a statistically... Yeah, okay, this is like a medical medical thing. Oh, that's nice. Conclusion. In practice, hormone therapy was found to be safe in this retrospective study. Ah, look at that. That's nice. Cool. Let's go on further. Effects of hormones and hormone therapy on breast tissue. Okay, we know what that does. Hormone therapy for transgender patients. Some meta-analysis? Transgender men and women, mainstay. Okay. Shown to have positive psychological and social effects. Wait, what are they even studying here? It looks like they're just talking about trans people. Hormone therapy has been shown to associate with positive outcomes for patients, but there are important metabolic implications of therapy that must be carefully considered. Yeah, of course. Hormones are a big deal. Hormone therapy, mental health, and quality of life among transgender people. We sought to systemically review the effect of gender-forming hormones. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. We included 20 studies reported in 22 publications. Wow, 20 studies. That's a lot of studies. Well, what's the conclusion? What are we finding out with this one, huh? Yes, Several previous reviews have indicated gender-affirming hormone therapy is associated with psychological benefits that include reductions in depression and anxiety and improvements in quality of life. Most of these reviews do not require a minimum duration of hormone therapy. One review that did impose a minimum follow-up is a requirement is 10 years old. Okay, so they're saying that some of these studies are relatively old. That's fine. What are the results? We retrieved 1,753 non-duplicate studies for the broader systemic review project of which this review was a part. Wow, they've been busy. All right. So we're only talking about 20 studies for this specifically. Man, they're busy, huh? They're working. They're schmoovin'. Yep, those are some studies. Study sizes range from 20 to 1,331. Oh, quality of life. Here we go. Seven studies assessed quality of life. An RCT found an improvement of approximately 5.5 points on a 10-point measure of life satisfaction? 5.5 on a scale of 10? For three groups of transgender men after one year of testosterone treatment, a before-after trial simultaneously or similarly reported that life satisfaction scores almost doubled among trans men over five years. A prospective study found a 16% quality of life improvement scores in transgender women. Again, guys, the real reason for this, just so you guys know, is that testosterone is a stronger chemical than estrogen, and trans men will see significant changes in their body much faster, both in their body and in their mind, like chemically, than trans women with estrogen. This is why um, hormone blockers are a bigger deal to trans women, because a lot of the stuff that female puberty does to your body, 
and is easier to fix or undo with testosterone than the reverse experiencing male puberty and then taking estrogen because that's testosterone it's a beefy chemical uh boys rule girls rule right okay um yeah that's a big reason for it you know yeah the 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 like back and forth for this is it's true um male to female bottom surgery is at a more advanced point than female to male bottom surgery so that's the that's where trans women get you back you know they're like ha trans you know d d you know testosterone may be a stronger chemical but i can do a dick loop de loop you know there you go um all right uh what is this no study found that hormone therapy decreased quality of life scores we conclude hormone therapy may include quality of life from trans people nice the strength of evidence for this conclusion is low due to concerns about bias in study designs imprecision and measurement because of small sample sizes and confounding by factors in gender affirming sur surgery status then do more studies that's the thing if you see like a dozen small studies and all of them are like, hey, this is really working and you're like, oh, okay, well, they're still pretty small, then just do more. We're on a good track. We got something good going on here, you know? Good things are happening at the moment. So that's quality of life. Depression. A prospective study found the proportion of transgender men and women showed symptoms of depression decreasing from 42 to 22 percent over 12 months of treatment. Nice, that's like cut in half. Scores were better for trans men. Wait, back to, scores improved by more than half among both trans men and trans women after 24 months. Wow, we conclude hormone therapy may decrease depression among transgender people. Wow, guys, it's going to keep going on like this. This is how easy it is to prove her wrong. These are the top results on Google Scholar. I'm not accessing some secret lefty knowledge here. This isn't a product of my expertise. It is as simple as going to the probably most accessible way of finding academic studies and just typing in trans effects of hormone therapy or any number of similar terms. The results will be the same. This is how wrong she is. There's a lot of studies. The effects of transgender hormone therapy on sleep and breathing. Okay, well, you know, people, people study lots of stuff, okay? People got to get their graduate degrees. With large uncertainties, the side effects can be substantial and the long-term consequences are mostly unknown. The side effects... W growing tits? Okay. Just exactly what is going on, no one really knows. But the reason... No, no, it's not, no, it's not a mystery. Okay is that the current increase in reports of gender dysphoria is caused by a mixture of two causes. Young people are more comfortable being openly trans and some of them erroneously believe they are trans because they've heard so much about it. I'd say that anyone who insists that one of those possibilities doesn't exist is pushing an agenda. Ah, there's the pushing an agenda line. She's just an objective, neutral, centrist arbiter, but anyone who takes issue with these narratives, ah, well, they're the ones pushing. She was referencing Jesse Single in this video multiple times, one of which she didn't even mention. Um, but no, you're the one pushing an agenda. What a piece of shit. What a f brainlet. Where's, where's her, where's her uh, f degree? I want to read her f doctorate thesis. I'm going to tear that shit apart. What, I will learn physics so that I can tear apart her doctoral thesis, okay? And shouldn't be taken seriously. The question is, how do you tell these two possibilities apart? This is currently unclear. And this is why countries like Sweden, Finland, and the UK are asking doctors to hold back with prescriptions. Yeah. It's super normal for a bunch of politicians to start a fear-mongering panic of, where is all this medicine stuff coming from? And then banning research and um, medical practice on it based on no evidence when all the evidence we have is positive. That's just a totally normal thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. the, all these far right... By the way, the, what we're talking about here, these are far right politicians, okay? The Swedish and British politicians that pushed this were not like normal scientific centrists. They were far right people. And Finland followed because of the, um, the national... Uh, 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 the, um, the NHS. So it's not like, oh, yeah, well, that's why these governments. No, these were far right moral panics. These weren't doctors.
facts. Because at the moment, they don't know how to deal with the sudden surge of girls presenting with gender dysphoria. They don't have to deal with it. They're politicians. That's not their f job. That's not how that's not how medicine works. Oh, you shut down research and practice on something even though it's shown to be beneficial because a bunch of far right politicians don't know how to deal with the sudden uptick in degeneracy? And they don't want to do any harm. So what do you think? Do you have children in that age group and are worried about I hate this woman. I hate this woman. Now she's yeah, she's going to do like the hello concerned parent, you know? What, you know, let's, uh, yeah, hmm, aren't you worried for your children? They might be hearing trans propaganda on TikTok. Are you transgender and see the situation differently? Let me know in the comments. Gender dysphoria, like most questions of mental and physical health, is a sensitive topic. And if you're looking for information online... Then just go to Google Scholar and, and, and you'll become a radical leftist in no time. You should ask her to debate. She's actually done debates in the past she might accept. There's no... I would... There's no shot. You really think she'd be stupid enough to accept? There are people in the uh, in the comments here who seem to be because because it's all like this civility centrist bullshit. So nobody's going to be really calling her out. But an important thing to remember is oftentimes any sort of these studies would be unethical to perform without an untreated control group. That's why you do longitudinal studies so that you in the past becomes the control group and you're not just arbitrarily holding a thousand trans people without medical care. What what was that about? Ninety nine percent happiness rate of people who have transitioned with their transition. One thing you didn't touch on. Oh, no, wait, this person's a turf or talking turf propaganda or whatever. Forcing left-handed people to write with the right hands is not harmless. It's been associated with stuttering and other conditions. Plenty more than that, too. I disagree and forced right-handed right writing was a trivial change. Yeah. Oh, this person's being smart. Puberty blockers not improving the state of affairs is rather expected when you account for the previously report, uh, reported discomfort. What they do is prevent things from getting worse. Okay, yeah, all right. Uh, so there are people, okay, her, she, she's not like a political pundit or whatever. Uh, can somebody find me her Twitter? I'll, I'll DM her after the stream. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, see if we can't directly address, uh, our problems with her research. Thank you. Damn, she doesn't have open DMs. I'll have to do a proper tweet then. It'll take me a while to think of how to phrase that. Thank you. I'd suggest email. Email would probably be a better idea with somebody like her. All right. Thank you.